Hello everyone, welcome back to Private Pilot Ground School. I'm Sergey, and in this video we'll be covering flight instruments and how they operate. To start off, make sure you have something to write notes on because there will be a lot of important information in this video that you'll need to remember and reference later on. And the second thing is, I know a lot of you might start flying technically advanced airplanes or airplanes with glass screens and you might think that this information doesn't apply, but flight instruments still work the same way uh, even though you might have what we call a glass cockpit or LCD screens instead of the regular analog uh, gauges. A compass is one of the most basic instruments you will find inside an airplane and it might sound kind of simple but there are a couple little quirks about a compass that you should know. Most of you know how a compass works. Let's say this is a magnet, this is north and this is south. So if north is over here, the compass will always point to the north and tell you where north is. And that's how a compass works. Now, uh, because you're in an airplane, you're not on the ground anymore. If you were to go over to the North Pole over here, when you got here, the compass would do this and point straight down at the North Pole, which means you wouldn't be able to see what your direction of heading is at all. Um, so what manufacturers do is they put a weight on the south side of the pole. That way when you get over to the North Pole, that counterweight um, still allows you to see the compass and see what direction you're going in. Now that little weight is what causes problems, and this is where you need to write stuff down. There are two compass errors that you might see if you pay attention when you're flying. First one is the acceleration or deceleration error. And we use the acronym ANDS, A-N-D-S, to uh, describe this error and what happens. When you accelerate, the compass turns towards the north, and when you decelerate, the compass turns towards the south. And the second thing, is the lead and lag error. If you're on a north heading and you decide to turn somewhere, the compass will lag behind. The compass will stay on north for a while and then it'll eventually catch up. Uh, same thing in the south side except the compass will go faster so it'll lead, it'll start on south and it'll go faster than you do. Eventually it'll catch up to you by the time you get to west. So those two errors happen on a compass uh, no matter what airplane it's in. It's because of that extra weight. Now there is another thing that happens uh, to a compass and that is interference. Believe it or not, all the instruments and the engine and everything inside the airplane has a magnetic field. And so the compass will be off just by a little bit. Um, so when you see a compass in most of the airplanes underneath the compass, you'll see a little compass correction card. And that'll tell you how far off the compass is. And that brings up another good point. If you're flying at night or you need to see the compass and it's dark, don't use your cell phone flashlight to do it because it will interfere with the magnetics of the compass and your compass will actually be off. So don't do it. This section covers pitot-static instruments and they're called pitot-static because they rely on the pitot tube and the static port. The pitot tube is an L-shaped tube and that is usually on the wing and you'll see it sticking out into the airflow. Most of them are heated by an electric current that runs through it to heat it up, especially for airplanes that are certified for instrument flight, and that's to prevent ice from forming on there. And then we also have a static port, and depending on the airplane, it might be next to the cowling, like on the Cessnas, or it might be behind uh, the baggage compartment, like on a Cirrus or something like that. We'll first talk about the altimeter, and the altimeter kind of resembles a clock in the way that the information is presented. We have a very short needle and that represents 10,000 feet. We have a medium needle that represents thousands of feet. And then the longest needle is hundreds of feet. And so in this example, it's showing 7,500 feet. The way we set our altimeter correctly is by listening to the airport weather. If you're departing from somewhere that doesn't have a weather station or automated weather, you can set the altimeter to the elevation and that will be accurate as well. The way an altimeter actually works is we have a case and inside the case we have aneroid wafers and they're sealed to a certain pressure. We also have a line that goes to the static port and it vents inside the case. So in other words, if there's a pressure difference outside, that pressure will also be felt inside the case and the wafers will either expand or contract 
and that will translate into a change in altitude on the altimeter. Basically, it takes pressure and it translates it to altitude. As we go up in altitude, the pressure decreases, and by the time we get to about 18,000 feet, the pressure is about half of what it is at sea level. And our altimeter will take that pressure and it will change that to indicate altitude. There are five different types of altitude, and this is a really good place to start writing them down. The first one is indicated altitude, and indicated is basically what you see on your altimeter. Whether or not it's set correctly, that's what it's indicating, and that is indicated altitude. Next type of altitude is true altitude, and true altitude is above sea level, or MSL, mean sea level, height above sea level. Absolute altitude is height above ground level, or AGL. Pressure altitude is true altitude, or MSL, corrected for non-standard pressure. And to get your pressure altitude, you take 2992, put that into your altimeter, and you see what your pressure altitude is. Depending on the high and the low pressures and the weather in your area, you might get your altitude, uh, your elevation, or you might not. And pressure altitude corrects for non-standard pressure. Density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for temperature differences. As air gets hotter, it expands, and there's less air molecules around. As air cools, it compresses and condenses, and there's more air molecules. So when an airplane is flying, it needs the air molecules to keep it afloat. So if it gets super hot, there's not as much uh, air molecules around, so the airplane would feel like it's at a higher altitude because there's less air molecules because of the higher temperature. So pressure altitude corrects for non-standard pressure, and then density altitude that's also corrected for temperature. Our next instrument is the Vertical Speed Indicator, or VSI, and it shows rate of climb or rate of descent in hundreds of feet per minute. So the 5 on there will be 500 feet a minute, the 10 will be 1000 feet per minute. The Vertical Speed Indicator works very much like the altimeter with one little difference. It measures differences in pressure of the outside air. So it uses the static air as a source, and there you have a calibrated leak. So basically it lets the air out of the case at a slow rate. That way it can actually register what the difference in pressure is. If there was no calibrated leak, the pressure would instantly equalize and you will always be climbing at zero feet per minute because the pressure would just be equal uh, all the time it would equalize. So there's a calibrated leak where the air comes out slow and it will show you your rate of climb or rate of descent. The airspeed indicator will show you your speed in knots or if it's an older airplane maybe miles per hour. Now the way it does that is it takes the moving air from the pitot tube and it compares that pressure to the pressure of the static port and it shows what the difference is in either miles per hour if it's an older airplane or in knots. If you take a closer look at the airspeed indicator you will notice different colors on the little arc that measures speed. And those colors do have meaning, and that's what we'll talk about next. So make sure this is something you write down as well. The white arc is the flap operating range. And the beginning of the white arc, or the slowest speed, is the stalling speed in a landing configuration. So that would be with flaps down, gear down, and that's when you would stall the airplane in a landing configuration. And we call that speed VSO. At the end of the white arc, or the faster end, is the maximum flap operating speed, or VFE. And this is the absolute maximum speed you can fly with the flaps extended without causing damage. The green arc is the normal operating range, and when you normally fly, you should be in the green arc. The low end of the green arc is your stalling speed in a clean configuration, or with the gear up and the flaps up, and we call that VS or you might see it as VS1 in some places. At the end of the green arc, you have VNO, or maximum structural cruising speed. And you shouldn't exceed this speed unless you're in smooth air, and then only with caution. The yellow arc is the caution arc, and you shouldn't be flying in the yellow unless, like I said once again, in smooth air, and then only with caution. At the end of the yellow arc, we have a red line, and we call that VNE, or never exceeds speed. And that's self-explanatory. It's a speed that you should never exceed, or things start bending and falling apart, and that's usually a bad thing. There are other airspeeds that are not marked on the airspeed indicator, and you should write them down as well. VA is your maneuvering speed, and this is the speed at which you can apply full abrupt control inputs 
and not cause any structural damage. VLO is landing gear operating speed and this is the maximum speed at which you can lower and extend the gear without causing any damage. VLE is the landing gear extended speed. This is the maximum speed you can fly with a landing gear extended. VX is the best angle of climb. If you climb at this speed you will get the most altitude within the shortest amount of horizontal distance. And VY is the best rate of climb. You will get the most amount of altitude in the shortest amount of time. To show you the difference between VX and VY, here's a clip from University of North Dakota showing both of the examples. Each airplane has different airspeeds, so you need to make sure that you have your V speeds memorized when you're going flying. Now there are five critical speeds that you absolutely have to know that aren't marked anywhere on the airspeed indicator. You can find them in your pilot operating handbook and I would suggest you do that as soon as you can. The first airspeed is your best glide airspeed and we use that if we lose an engine that's what you uh, fly at to get the most distance out of the airplane, best glide speed. Next speed is your maneuvering speed or VA. Then we have VX and VY and those are your best angle and best rate of climb. And then finally we have your crosswind. It's not really a V speed but it's your crosswind limitation or maximum crosswind you can land with. And those five are absolutely essential and you should know them before you even get in the airplane because you won't be able to pull out a book or look at your airspeed indicator to see what those numbers are when you're flying and you lose an engine for example. The pitot-static system is great, it doesn't require any power, but there are errors that can happen even with this system. And so I would highly recommend that you read the chapter in the Pilot Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge about flight instruments, I think it's chapter 7. Um, there's going to be a link in the description. And it talks about what happens if either your pitot source or your static port gets blocked and what happens to the instruments. I would highly recommend reading that.